pace is nothing but something about 80 kilometers or 50 miles how do you go from zero to actual successful rocket launch in just two years typically what happens is that most failures happen in the first few seconds right you can test a rocket only when it is flying that's the only way you can completely test a rocket when the scientist bus was going on the road right people used to throw stones at the bus in fact one of the proudest moments is uh, doing a launch in record time we were uh, as far as i remember seventh country in the world to actually launch a satellite uh, to orbit i i get dreams of rocket launches <laughs> Hello, I am Mukesh Pansal. Welcome to Sparks. Our guest today is Pawan Chandana. Pawan is the founder and CEO of Skyroot Aerospace. Skyroot recently became the first private space company out of India to launch a rocket into space. Pawan is an engineer from IIT Kharagpur. He worked in ISRO for 6 years. He is deeply passionate about space. He has the ambition of eventually building human settlement in space. He has big ideas about space. I have had the good fortune of working with Pawan and have a in-depth conversation about how he went about building Skyroot, how they became one of the very few companies in the world to have their first launch being successful, putting India onto global map and demonstrating that we can do big things out of India. Hope you enjoy this conversation. Hi Pawan. Hello, hi Mukesh. Welcome to Fox. Yeah, good. In fact, like we used to meet in boardrooms, so good to see a uh, meeting here. Yeah, no, sir. This is the start of a new initiative. It's just an experiment, and I'm thrilled that you're you're able to make it. I'm honored, and uh, you know, all the best to the new initiative. Thank you, Pawan. I want to. I mean, we have traversed a lot of distance together, but I want to take you back to the moment when you managed to launch rocket into space. First private space company out of India to do that. I was with you in Shrihar Kota, but in the back seats. you were out there in the front in the command center and as the clock was winding down and we reached to you know t minus 20 second my heart rate was racing you know i could barely control my excitement and nervousness can you walk us through what was going through your head you and bharat sitting there what were you guys thinking about so in fact like uh, the last two months before the launch uh, we had like uh, very very less sleep you know hardly we slept you know we were at sriar kota doing you know a lot of uh, various works there and uh, hardly i think the last few weeks we had like probably a couple of hours of sleep that's all you know so we were already zombies sitting there <laughs> and then we were doing a rocket mission there so in fact uh, uh, our mind went black you know, in fact last 20 seconds uh, it was my mind completely it was blank because i know that this is the very important moment and almost like years of effort coming through in just few seconds typically what happens is that most failures happen in the first few seconds right you know <laughs> so you know like after few seconds you know that okay you're in reasonably good conditions so the first few seconds are very important in rocket launch and uh, my mind totally stalled and i was already a zombie there at that my mind completely stalled at that point of time and uh, so it's a mix of like you said you know it's a mix of uh, excitement and nervousness so you're not watching the countdown after 20 seconds uh, i don't know I, i was watching it but the moment i know it's in the countdown last right. countdown it's like it's like in a different trance zone you know my mind was in a trance zone and uh, and and it was like a mix of excitement and nervousness you know because uh, we were sure that it is going to do well you know and uh, uh, and also like you know there's nervousness that anything can go wrong you know there are like a zillion things can ro- go wrong in the first few seconds of a rocket launch so knowing that and also uh, you know having that confidence that okay something good is going to turn up because after years of effort it's a very mixed feeling and uh, i think uh, i still get goosebumps you know just remembering those moments you know just uh, so so what happens is that this intense tension in the minus 10 seconds for example intense tension again just after the launch you know that things are going well and it turns into excitement and jubilation for the first few seconds so just in milliseconds you can just imagine minus 1 second to 1 second it's like intense tension goes to a bit of a relaxation and excitement just in few milliseconds so i remember you know as we hit t0 the rocket took off and we were able to monitor everything on the screen and everything seemed to go picture perfect according to the plan So at what point you start to feel relieved that this is really happening? Yeah. So in fact, uh, after a few seconds, uh, you know, uh, I realized there's a onboard camera on mm-hmm. the rocket, right? You know, where we were able to see the ground, yeah. uh, you know, from going. Then I realized that okay, it's going in the right direction, and I could see that you know it's it's the range and the altitude, everything going well right. as expected. And uh, so what happens is that this particular rocket is after first few seconds, typically you know everything goes well, yeah. you know. So I think after like four or five seconds. uh got a jolder okay things are going well decently well and uh, uh, and then like started clapping and then getting excited and then 
it's good then watching exactly what's happening and then you know came to the senses and start observing the technicalities of the launch right right absolutely how many times before you visualize this moment i mean uh, <laughs> um, I think uh, several times. In fact, I I worked in Israel as you know, right? right. Uh, so I was part of few uh, you know launch missions there, and uh, but but never. Uh, this is more like a baby, you know. For, for build for you know since five years we've been building uh, uh, you know the rocket uh, uh, from uh, you know in 2018. You know we started uh, building the company. Uh, so it's like our own uh, kind of our own baby coming and uh, you know getting into a, a, a launch that day. So I think it was like very exciting uh, journey uh, overall. And uh, many times uh, we have imagined that rocket launch. In fact, I, I get dreams of rocket launches. Our rockets. In fact, some dreams are like in the contrary, where like it doesn't go well, and suddenly it gets a joke. I mean, because we sleep with a lot of tension many times. Things are not working. You know, it's like uh, sleep with a lot of tension, and I keep getting these kind of dreams as well. So I had visualizations of things working really well, and also working really bad in the dreams as well. See, in the you know everyday life, we use this phrase. You know, this is not a rocket science. Yeah. you know we imply as if if something rocket science is beyond reach of mere mortals but here you are in just last 5 years from initial conception to actually launching launching a rocket in space and from what what i understand you guys are among the very few people company anywhere in the world ever yeah. to have the first launch successful yeah. how does it make you feel i mean wonderful i mean uh, i would say in fact one of the proudest moments is Uh, doing a launch in record time. In yeah. fact, you know this particular uh, launch, we were actually developing the orbital launch. Then we right. done one for a long time. Yeah. You know, then we started, uh, suddenly decided in one of the board meetings that you know we would uh, do a you know quick uh, demonstrator uh, launch to space. And uh, within two years, we from that moment, within two years, we were able to launch a rocket. You know, which was record times in the aerospace industry. Typically, you know, launching, designing a rocket from scratch to a launch in two years was record time. and succeeding in the first attempt is very 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 rare typically in the market so i mean this gives us good confidence that you know we're in the right track uh, and but still you know rockets are crazy so we need to be very cautious of every step we probably you know uh, even the 50th rocket launch we would be of same uh, we would be like having the same tension probably even more tension uh, uh, you know so it's a, f- a phenomenal journey it gives us good pride and uh, it also like the significance of the event is also like uh, pretty large is what i feel because uh, you know a startup building a rocket and launching in a very short period of time and succeeding in the first attempt in india i think is a i think a great uh, a symbol of what a startup can do what right. young entrepreneurs can do. yeah no absolutely i think you know that and later i think i'll ask you a lot of detail question about what happened in those two years and how do you go from zero to actual successful rocket launch in just two years but before that let's you know backtrack i want to go to very early phase of your journey did you always think about building rocket even when you were a kid No, no, not exactly. Actually, in fact, like I was fascinated by rockets, mm-hmm. but never thought I uh, would build one because I thought it's rocket science. You know, <laughs> like everybody else, we we think that it's like it's not our league, right? You know, and uh, but but then like I was very fascinated with mechanical engineering, with machines right. uh, in general. Uh, so naturally, you know, I took it. I took up uh, mechanical engineering in college. You know, and uh, uh, at IIT also, like uh, I was watching the news of PSLV launches, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Always had that fascination. How how are we able to build such complex machines which defy gravity and then you know, launch to space yeah so, but before you know coming to college actually let's just imagine you know when you were i don't know 10 year old 12 year yeah, old yeah yeah where did you grow up you know what was your childhood growing up like what were your dreams back then yeah yeah so so i was i was born in a small town called machli patnam you know it's, it's like machli patnam <laughs> yeah okay <laughs> so 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 it's nothing related to machli but uh, you know it's it's uh, the name is called machli right. patnam it's a very small town uh and uh, both my parents uh, originate from there mm-hmm. and uh, uh so i was born there and then uh, my dad is an engineer civil engineer and he got uh, a job in wizag you know the wizag port and then we shifted to wizag and the entire my schooling was in wizag up to getting into iit it was completely in wizag yeah got it got it yeah. and what were your dreams growing up you know what did you want to do yeah. did you have If somebody ever asked you what do you want to be when you grow up, you know, yeah, what would you yeah. have said? So in fact, like occasionally, uh, in fact, when I was born, yeah, my grandfather told this guy is going to become a scientist. Oh wow! You know, because because my head was big <laughs> <laughs> compared to my uh, body, right. so then he thought like you know immediately told this uh, you know kid is going to become a scientist, and uh, so that was there that played a role. You know, wanted to become an engineer, scientist, right. and uh, kind of thing. Is your grandfather still around? Uh, no, no, he passed away. He passed away. Okay. He would have been really proud of. Yeah, what you yes. have accomplished. Yeah. When did you go to college? Uh, so uh, in two thousand 
2007 around yeah 2007 i entered college and by that time you knew you wanted to study mechanical engineering yes. not aerospace yes yes yeah yeah so yeah so i, I told I, i never wanted to like build rocket i never thought of that as the main uh, aim per se and but i was very fascinated with machines but as i did mechanical engineering i i understood that the most complex machine i i just want challenge in life and i thought the most challenging machine ever is rocket and that was i was very convinced you know looking at the uh, uh, the kind of uh, tech it involves and you know having the little things i know uh, i was very sure that there is the most complicated machine ever built in uh, by humans right. that's where i want to you know put my mechanical engineering skills on right. so that was i was very sure during college and were you like good student in college yeah so in fact uh, i sh- just go in school i was very bad student at school okay you know, how fact, bad how bad that <laughs> i i remember like i get i got something like 51 marks in maths You know, that's terrible. That's terrible. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You know, so very terrible, and uh, I think much below average student. It's getting and, uh, unschooling you like. <laughs> you have built rockets. I have not built rockets. So I have no right to tell you. Yeah. So, so, so what happened is that in school, like I was a very bad student up to my eighth standard. Then I changed my school. Then there are some teachers who thought this guy had some spark. You know, somehow I don't know. They felt like that, and they started encouraging me. And I never got that much attention ever in school life. So to just retain that attention, I used to study. and i studied and math really uh, you know fascinated me i used to read a lot and lot of math and physics uh, during school and that uh, transformed my academics from a very very bad student to a very good uh, student just because of the teachers wow so just you know change of school and one teacher paying attention on you completely shifted you know your approach to education just one right? teacher math teacher yeah. and uh, shifting the sh- uh, school different environment and i became under below average student to one of the toppers you know that's the school and that's incredible and i think generally you know i have seen any you know impact journey that in that inspiration or trigger which can come from anywhere but the small intervention someone caring or someone really believing on you can completely alter that trajectory absolutely you know, somebody would have looked to you like i don't know what your grades were but till eighth grade and would not have expected too much from you yeah but this person saw something in you have you ever gone back and thanked the person oh no absolutely you know i uh, i still now will come really lost touch with him but i used to be in touch with uh, them and in fact same journey happened in college as well you know initially after getting into iit in fact uh, uh, my parents told get into an iit or that's typically how all middle class families uh, tell you get into an iit your life is set so i thought my life is set and then i stopped studying in college and uh, for the first uh, few years i was a very bad student there also and then there also one one of my professors like you know felt that this guy had a spark and then that transformed my academics there also so same thing happened uh, two you turns again even when i met you in 2018 i thought you were a spark <laughs> our podcast is also called miracle sparks wow. so i think pavan you are the best candidate you know everyone sees a spark in you and you are literally sparking imagination for all of india but okay i'm getting ahead of myself come back to that so in college um so you did your uh, btech in mechanical engineering yeah yeah and from there you joined uh, isro directly yeah so so i did the dual degree you know, okay. btech plus mtech ah, btech okay. in mechanical engineering mtech in thermal science and right. engineering which which id was this id karakpur karakpur okay yeah right. yeah so right. yeah yeah and isro came for campus recruitment yes yes it's very rare that isro comes to campus right i think it's the second time ever uh, that isro came to campus right. yeah but these days pavan like everybody who goes to iit at some point you figure out you know what the attractive jobs are in terms of compensation etc and pretty much everybody ends up in a software job because they obviously play pay really well what were you thinking you know when you took up the job with isro i cannot imagine it was a very high paying job yeah yeah it was definitely not a high paying job in fact like i was very clear after doing mechanical engineering despite the first initial years i was not a very good student but but per se after that i just uh, probably had a g- good u turn that i was really fascinated with the tech and went so deep actually and then uh, i realized i need to stick to it you know to the core uh, field uh, and i never thought of even applying to non core fields you know and in fact when i came to know isro came to campus i was absolutely sure i need to only sit for isro uh, you know that you know uh, you have to let go yeah, other companies to actually uh, sit for another company so in fact i didn't sit for any other company i just directly came to isro's interview day and then went for isro interview yeah. see that's the other thing right you know again anyone who wants to create large impact at some point in life you have to realize what do you really care about and now committing to that is not you know the hardest part hardest part is letting go everything else yeah. because you can keep all these options going you can always postpone it to at later date okay let me do something let me do an mba let me save some money yeah. and, and things keep happening right so i think so that commitment that you only wanted to work for isro by the time your final year uh, final year is incredible what are you the only one in your batch to have oh, that thought process actually, very interestingly uh, actually isro 
was a uh, lot of people wanted to get into distraction. Okay. <laughs> so there was huge competition. Right. And uh, uh, in fact, like uh, four people got selected and the other three were toppers, you know. So I was, I was, I was like, you know, I told just above average, you know, seven pointer in college. And uh, all others were like nine pointers or close to nine pointers. And uh, and in fact, I was told uh, uh, my interview was the best somehow, you know. Uh, uh, that is because uh, typically, you know, whatever I learned, I went very deep. Yeah. That was the uh, principle I've been following. Uh, so, so give us some glimpse of what are the topics you went very deep, you know, in your college yeah. days. Yeah, yeah. So mainly thermal engineering because my okay. master's was in thermal engineering. Right. And uh, so I was uh, actually working on a NASA a project, right. uh, you know, designing a cryo cooler uh, for for some, uh, you know, NASA mission. Wait, you need to step back. <laughs> Can you first explain what is thermal engineering and what is cryo cooler? Yeah, cryo -cooler. The, thermal engineering is more about, you know, just thermal management, you know, because, uh, for example, in any vehicle, aerospace vehicle, so a lot of heat generated, you know, just managing the, even in satellite, there's a lot of heat generated, you know, managing the thermal uh, heat exchangers, you know, you need cooling wherever you want, HVAC systems, you know, so, so this all are taught in thermal engineering. Just, uh, it's, it's about managing heat, you know, which is a very complex engineering problem, which yeah. almost everything we see has a thermal problem, per se, right. including our PCs, laptops, watches, everything has a thermal problem. We don't like anything heating up. So that's all about thermal engineering and thermal management. Uh, so that's where like my uh, master's was on. And uh, so I joined uh, my master's uh, pro uh, MTP, it's called, right? So MTech project uh, with uh, uh, both my BTEC project and MTech project in a center called Cryogenic Engineering Center. You know, so they... In, at ID, ID, ID Karakpur. Karakpur. That's okay. the only cryogenic engineering center. Oh, wow. yes. So that works at cryogenic temperature. You know, right. fluids at cryogenic temperatures, ex extremely low temperatures. And these are the propellants which are used in rockets. You know, so they were they work very closely with the Indian uh, Space Research Organization, ISRO. And uh, so that's where they have projects with ISRO and NASA projects. Yeah. Kind of, uh, I remember uh, there was a collaboration India had with Russia at some point. Yeah. For yeah. transfer of some, you know, cryogenic technology. Yes, yes. Was the center involved in that in any way? Uh, yeah, so this is more like an academic center. Okay. Uh, you know, so uh, that was because it's a very strategic, uh, this thing, it happened, uh, you know, government to government and just to ISRO, you know, because that's like very uh, far-held uh, technology per se. It was done only to ISRO. But ISRO works with uh, this center for a lot of simulations for right. cryogenics. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. So you joined ISRO which year? Uh, it's in uh, 2012. 2012. Yeah. How was your first year at ISRO? I mean, ISRO is, you know, this, uh, you know, hallowed organization. You know, we are all as Indians extremely proud of what ISRO has achieved. Yeah. So what was it like walking into ISRO campus and absorbing, you know, all the vibe, atmosphere, history around you? Absolutely. In fact, like when you said uh, the vibe, I remember the first day at ISRO, uh, you know, I just walked into, uh, in fact, I was fortunate enough to work in a uh, uh, department at ISRO, which does all the integration of the rocket, where, you know, a lot of big structure, rocket structures are right. being, you know, assembled there. And just the sight of it gave me goosebumps right. on day one, yeah. you know, and I was in a way very excited to join ISRO. And on the first day itself, looking at a big uh, assembly floor, and I mean, it gives so I'll come back to this, yeah. but why does everything about space gives us goosebumps? It does for me as well. Like, what do you think is about space? That fascinates all of us so much. It's probably the explorative nature of human mind, you know. So we always think something mysterious and in inaccessible thing is always fascinating. And uh, and the space is always fascinating. I mean, for every kid, uh, you know, I think most kids are nowadays excited with space and space tech, you know, because they feel that some mystery to be, uh, unsolved mystery to be uh, solved and uh, something to explore. So that explorer mindset, I think, is a natural fascination for. No, absolutely. And we'll talk a lot more about that. And I think um, Skyroot on its part is doing huge amount of work to inspire even more, you know, millions of kids. It is one thing for ISRO to launch these big rockets. Another thing, you know, somebody who is just few years out of college to think about building rockets and to be able to do that. I think that's what really makes it believable. You know, everyone think, you know, if Pawan can do it, so can, you know, so can I, right? So just... Um, what was the focus in the first few years, ISRO? Like, you, were you specializing in a particular area? You know, what are, yeah. Do you have to push yourself to learn particular skills? Yeah, so absolutely. In fact, uh, uh, the first few years, as I mentioned, I was in part of integration uh, division at uh, ISRO. So I was part of a program called GSLE Mark III, you know, which is the largest rocket ever built in the country. And uh, that is going to launch humans to space, uh, astronaut, Indian astronauts to right. space in the, in the coming year. Yeah, maybe before you continue, yeah. so, uh, you know, ISRO has many different rockets yeah. that have been built over a period of time. Correct. Can you just talk about, you know, what is the evolution of, you know, what are the different breakthroughs ISRO has achieved yeah, yeah. by the time, you know, you joined the ISRO campus? Yeah, yeah. So, in fact, like, uh, 
uh, ISRO is one of the very few successful organizations globally. It's like considered top five space organizations in the world. In the whole world. The whole world. And it has at par technology to anybody in the world, you know, especially in the rockets and satellites. And uh, and that's what makes us different. In fact, we we started off in uh, our space program started off in 1960s, right? You know, and in 1960s, NASA has landed man on moon, right? You know, our space program just started. Who started in 60s? How did the space program under when he started here? So so, Doctor Sarabhai, Doctor Vikram Sarabhai, uh, he is the one uh, who is the chief architect of the space program in the country. So he started uh, it as uh, part of the Department of uh, Atomic Energy, uh, called INCOSPAR. It right. was a small organization for space research. Yeah, we started in 1962, which turned uh, to uh, ISRO later part of the decade. Right, you know. So th that's how it started. And uh, just imagine India 1960s yeah. starting a space program. You know, no, uh, I'm absolutely fascinated. In fact, I'm going to slow you down a little bit. And I know you guys are big fan of Dr. Vikram Sarabhai. Your rockets are named after him. Yeah. What else do you recall about, you know, that time in 1950s, 1960s, you know, what was it like for him yeah. back then to start a space program? And you know, what do you know about that? Yeah, yeah. So, in fact, like, I think a lot of this history is shown in a series called Rocket Boys. Right. Which was, like, superb series. In fact, I love the series. And, in fact, I also, uh, uh, you know... Uh, so Rocket Boys 2 is going to be about you guys, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so, uh, so that's where, like, you know, uh, Vikram, Vikram Sarabhai is, is a big inspiration for uh, the entire... Uh, you know, space community. Mm -hmm. just, just imagine 1960s India. Mm -hmm. I mean, very bad economic yeah. situation. Correct. And uh, just imagine a scientist uh, saying that I want to start a space program. People would typically laugh laugh at it because considering that so many countries, right. you know, even even having, uh, you know, very good economy don't have a space program, proper space program even today. Right. So just imagine 1960s, uh, he was able to pitch to the government, yeah. you know, and, uh, uh, and, and then like the government has... Uh, invested in that idea uh, and then like supported it, nurtured it. It is phenomenal. I, I cannot even imagine how that could happen. It's incredible. It was just 10 years, you know, from independence. India was among the poorest countries in the world. world yes. At that time, there were so yeah. many problems. And yeah. do, you, do you have any idea what kind of budget he started with? I mean, I'm not sure. But in fact, they started uh, in a small church, you know. Small uh, church? Church in, uh, in in a village, fishing village called Thumba in, the, in Kerala. Uh, and that's where like the journey started uh, and in fact it was like a uh, quite a dusty place is what I was told and they really cleaned everything and then all the first set of scientists were recruited and then they were operating out of the church just beside the uh, beach where they used to build those small rockets and launch. So these are you know, genuine stories of impact. There is somebody you know who really believed yeah. that that is something like that is possible in India. Yeah. Pro I'm guessing it must have taken him many, many years of pursuing government to get some tiny budget probably yes. going to this fishing village yeah. and starting and fast forward to 60 years from now, as you're saying, ISRO is now in the top five space organization in the world. I mean, yeah. that's the absolutely you know perfect journey of impact. One person's vision, conviction, playing the long game and eventually let the results compound. Yeah. So he started you know ISRO in 1960s. Yeah. What has been ISRO journey like? What are some of the big breakthrough moments? And yeah. What are the you know, big rockets ISRO has built? Or yeah, yeah. So, so in fact, like they started off with uh, sounding rockets. Uh, sounding rockets do atmospheric measurements uh, in space. Uh, so that's where the, very humbly they started. And in fact, they got some uh, rockets from US and from France, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and started. Uh, how big will they start? How do we visualize these rockets? How what is the height? Uh, so the probably the first uh, few rockets would be like this tall, maybe like so just a little bigger than Diwali rocket. Tall. Yeah, yeah, little bigger than Diwali rocket. That's where it uh, started, and uh, slowly, slowly they big uh, they start building bigger versions of this. Right. Uh, you know, and they call this Rohini series of rockets. Okay. And then uh, they used to launch them, mm -hmm. and then uh, they wanted to translate into satellite launching. Sure. You know, which requires much bigger rockets. You know, because it it takes a uh, uh, huge energy to put uh, something into orbit. You know, because you need to put uh, something into orbit at a speed of like uh, 7.8 kilometers a second. You know, the, un until the rocket puts something, you know, creates that much velocity to something, it will not orbit. So, so to put a satellite in orbit, you need to put the tremendous amount of energy uh, to the satellite. That can be given by a big rocket. So, they started off with uh, a rocket called SLV-3. You know, a small launch vehicle, uh, uh, you know, 3. And the height, launch height of SLV will be how much? Around 20 meters. 20 meters, so 60 feet. So, that's about what? Uh, seven story building seven story building yeah 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 yeah, yeah. so it's it's like uh, a satellite launch vehicle 3 uh, so that's when uh, uh, the journey started and the project director of that rocket was dr apj abdul kalam oh wow you know <laughs> and, and this was in what 80s 70s 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 
and uh, and and so that was like a uh, good breakthrough for us uh, because a country like india launching a satellite to orbit we were uh, as far as i remember seventh country in the world to actually launch a satellite uh, to orbit and from there very few countries actually launched so after 20 years of effort from 1960 onward by 80s yeah. india was able to launch rocket yeah. successfully in orbit. by 70s itself by 70s yeah. okay and, and then like they started launching more and more of these uh, yes yeah, so just talk a bit more about you know what is pslv what is gslv yeah, correct so so the slv is more like you can say demonstrator kind of the rocket okay. that we have demonstrated capability right. to launch satellite to orbit yeah and then uh, what they did is that had failures initially right and then it took uh, you know a few failures to succeed and then we succeeded they uh, then they started something called aslv augmented uh, you know satellite launch vehicle so that was a different uh, slightly bigger version of this and that also failed miserably you know in fact uh, i had like few senior scientists tell me that when aslv failed uh, in fact when uh, in, in trivandrum that's where like uh, the entire the rocket program was there yeah. when the scientist bus was going on the road right. people used to throw stones at the bus oh wow this was in again 80s yes yes yeah so that was the kind of what people used to think that like you know the scientists are burning money you know uh, it was because of the uh, continuous failure some of these folks are still at isro yeah yeah yes yes wow yeah, incredible yeah, yeah so in fact like uh, the, so that experience uh, was that time you know people most people used to think that this is unnecessary spending on uh, the exchequer and uh, just like you know and also like uh, the worst part is that rockets actually fall in the sea so so what they feel uh, so it, it gives a feeling that the money is dumped in the sea <laughs> so so that way like you know the common man thinks that you know we are dumping our money in the sea for nothing so this is the kind of uh, image uh, uh, you know after these failures so coming back from that is i think that's the stepping stone for what isro is today these initial slv failures and eslv failures were actually stepping stone of their mindset and then that led to Uh, PSLV actually the PSLV was a meaningful payload mm. where we can launch meaningful s- satellites right. and get services uh, through these satellites right you know and then PSLV was built in the 90s right and launched again first launch was failure yeah then they built the second rocket right. and was successful this was in 90s 90s okay. yeah yeah and then the second rocket from then on till now it only had one failure and that was during my tenure when I was at ISRO right. and no it was a jolt basically <laughs> it was a jolt across the organization because after 30 Uh, i think 39 successful missions wow. suddenly the 30 uh, 40th mission failed mm. you know and that was a jolt across the organization right. and in fact i personally learned a lot from that experience does any other or- organization has this kind of track record of you know not a single failure for 39 launches in a row yeah i think spacex has it now okay. uh, but uh, you know before that i think uh, uh, you know we have it and also there is like uh, uh, an american company called uh, ula you know which is uh, between boeing and uh, you know so that also had a good success rate you know so but very few uh, globally and uh, so pslv is not only reliable it is also very affordable you know that made it like uh, there's a big queue for launching satellites on pslv uh, because it turned out to be like everybody knows that pslv you put a satellite in pslv it's a success and it is like very uh, you know very affordable for the most satellite players so it became like one of the uh, you know go to player for launching so satellites. pslv is launching into low earth orbit yeah. right yes all all these rockets slv aslv PSLV all are launching to low earth orbit right but that that the immediate next rocket yeah. so low earth orbit is not sufficient for you know launching to right. a geostationary orbit so when you launch a satellite to geostationary orbit it will be stationary with respect to earth you know so what happens is that you can get communication services uh, permanently and india needs communication services you know very much you know tv uh, tv comes from satellites you know almost direct to home the dish everything you know directly gets beamed from satellite and that's how a life becomes better with you know television directly connected right. to the satellite so that started with gslv right. to have a meaningful payload to launch so this was just, early uh, 2000 yes yes okay yeah, yeah. so that's where uh, the russian uh, uh, you know cryogenic uh, technology there was a transfer uh, of technology and then again gslv multiple rockets failed you know and uh, and then that was also like considered as like a very difficult cryogenic tech is uh, in fact very difficult to master Uh, and then you know the rockets were failing etc etc and uh, and during my tenure the first uh, major success was there you know during that i was there I, i was able to see all this happening right did you watch some of these gslv launches yeah 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 yes, directly yes, i was there in fact i i went for one of the gslv launch live i was able to launch uh, i was able to see and uh, uh, and then i also saw uh, mangalyan uh, ah, uh, you know launch the right. uh, 
uh, you know, the mission to the Mars. Also, right. during the same tenure, I was there. So, a lot of leading missions were there. Right. And uh, so, then GSLE came, it was failing. And then, you know, there were only less launches of right. GSLE because of that. And then the ultimate uh, for India was GSLE Mark 3, the biggest rocket ever built in the how, country. How big? Uh, so, it's like around uh, 43 meters tall. 43 meters will make it about what 20 story building uh yeah around 15 uh, 15 story, story building right yeah yeah 15 story building wow. tall but it's very fat <laughs> you know so so in fact like not a fuel yeah 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 so it's it's like uh, you might have seen images with two big boosters right the rocket you know, so this is yes. for heavy uh, payload, payload for uh, geostationary yeah. orbit. geostationary orbit and in fact the media started calling it the bahubali rocket you know because it's like very big and huge kind of a rocket and uh, so I was lucky enough to be part of the last leg of the development of this rocket. So I was part of the first couple of missions. Okay. Uh, launch. What exactly were you doing for these rockets? Uh, so I was part of the integration team. Okay. So I was part of like, you know, designing the components for integration, right. then integrating the rockets, sure. and then taking it to the launch pad. Right. Uh, you know, be part of the launch campaign, and then, you know, doing the post analysis of the launch, etc. Right. So I want to just look at a little bit, you know, geeky for a second. And I think as far, you know, because listeners who are going to listen to this podcast, see, want them to understand, you know, when we talk about launching, you know, uh, satellites into orbit, what do we mean? How far they go? Yeah. So from what I understand, you have this low Earth satellites. Yeah. So can you explain to how high the low Earth yeah. satellite is yeah. and how fast those satellites go? How long does it take for those satellites to complete one full revolution around the Earth? Correct. Yeah. So typically, you know, space is nothing but something about 80 kilometers or 50 miles yeah. uh, above the Earth's surface. That's called space because... The uh, air density is so low, it's it's like considered as vacuum, you know, almost black. So once you cross 80 kilometers, you see black. Yeah, yeah. So the blue sky goes away. Yeah, blue sky goes away, even slightly lower as well. But generally, is a common technical definition is like 80, 80 kilometers. kilometers. It's called as some line, right? It's yeah, so 100 kilometers is called common, common line. line. So there's always a debate whether 80 kilometers is space right. or 100 kilometers sure. is space. Right. Uh, because, for example, Virgin Galactic, right. they were below 100, uh -huh. but above 80. Right. You know, and yeah. uh, and then like uh, uh, Blue Origin went yeah. above 100. Right. So there's always debate, you know, which is space. But still, like, uh, commonly accepted is above 80 kilometers is uh, space. And uh, uh, and 100 kilometers is called common line. So so just technically assume that anything above 80 is uh, space. And still, even though it's like vacuum, still there is like some air density. Okay. Right. So, so when you put something at, let's say, 120 kilometers, technically you're putting the satellite in space. Right. But uh, what happens is that because of the still air friction, yeah. there'll be little air friction. That will be enough to drag it down. Drag it down, and then it falls in the atmosphere. Sure. It's gone. So typically, uh, above 400 kilometers is a stable orbit. It will stay there for several years. You yeah. know, typically. So that's why most of the low Earth orbits above 400 kilometers, up to 2,000 kilometers. Anything is called low Earth orbit because below 400 will drag it down, and above 200, 2,000 kilometers, many people may not require it. Right. You know, you, what? Is, where, where is the concentration? Most of the lower around 500 kilometers. Around 500 kilometers. Yeah, yeah, 500 kilometers. And at that. Uh, in that orbit, 500 kilometers worth, you know, from here to Hyderabad, you know, something like that, yeah, right? I think yeah, yes, that yes. kind of distance. So at that, so uh, how you know how fast are those satellites traveling? Yeah. And how long does it take for them to complete, you know, one full cycle around that? Yeah. So typically, it takes, uh, uh, you know, a rocket should uh, put a satellite at 7.8 kilometer per second, around that kilometers a second you yeah. know so that is the speed at which the rocket has to put the satellite into orbit then only it orbits right. uh, around the earth anything less it falls in the sea right. you know anything more it goes into an elliptical orbit right you know so 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 there should be very precise insertion right uh, very high level of precision is required right. and uh, that is around 7.8 kilometer per second at this altitude so we have to right. put it and then it will keep on orbiting right. so typically low earth orbits around 90 minutes to do one orbit and around 15 16 orbits a, a day is what uh, it, it does and so, so what happens is that uh, when you watch these satellites, they keep moving, right. you know, uh, with respect to Earth, they keep moving. Uh, so what? So you cannot give continuous services. Yeah. That's where you need geostationary service right. communication. So these kind of fast-moving satellites, which are yeah. closer to Earth, yeah. what are they primarily used for? Yeah, they're used for Earth observation. So that means like they click images of Earth at different portions of Earth yeah. uh, from space. And these images are used for various purposes. You know, across industries, they're used. In fact, that itself is like a multi-billion dollar uh, sales of satellite images. And uh, and uh, so these uh, satellites, because they're moving, but they're close to Earth. So they can click images, just like, you know, closer it is better for the cameras. Uh, you know, so these low Earth orbits are good for Earth imaging. And most of these satellites are uh, used for right. Earth imaging. So you've got these low Earth satellites, 500 kilometers above. Yeah. They're going at about, almost, I think, 25,000 kilometers per hour. Yeah. yeah. And... Uh, 
Yeah, and they're completing one full revolution in 90 minutes or so. They're going really fast. Yes. yes. And then you have this geostationary orbit, which yeah. is way up there. Way up there. So, like, yeah. how far up and, you know, yeah. why are those rockets much, much harder to build? Yeah, so it's like uh, 36,000 kilometers. Wow. Yeah. You know? So, that's almost like, what, 70 times further. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So, that's where, like, you need the more energy right. uh, to put them to the those altitudes. And uh, so that's where you need bigger rockets. Right. That's where GSLV, PSLV became GSLV mm -hmm. and GSLV Mark III. You know, these are the right. uh, bigger rockets which uh, can put large payloads into right. geostationary orbit. Right. Okay, now I want to come to about Skyroot, you know, starting. Yeah. yeah. So you, I think you spent six years at ISRO. Yeah. At what time did you start thinking about, you know, you want to actually step out of ISRO yeah. and start yeah. your own company and not any other company, yeah. but to actually build rockets? I don't think that in 2018 there was anybody in the private space was even thinking about starting a rocket yeah, company. Yeah, so yeah. just walk me through the process. You know, when do you start think about it? When do you commit to it? Yeah. And then, you know, stepping yeah. out of that. So, so basically, the seed uh, seed of, you know, wanting to start up actually was in college days. Okay. You know, where like uh, in IITs, you see, most people want to start their own companies. Right. At least during my time also, yeah. it was there. Right. And uh, so the entrepreneurial vibe was there. Mm -hmm. And uh, that bug also bit me. And I was also wanting to, oh, you know, become an entrepreneur. Because I like independence, I like, you know, impact, you know, everything of that sort. So I was really uh, attracted towards building a company, but I felt that I don't have no idea what to build. And and so, like, I just followed my passion, went into ISRO, but always at the back of the mind, I always want to start a company. And any kind of company or you had some ideas even back then or what kind of company? You something did? which uh, does big impact, you know, something very big. I didn't want to start anything small. So, uh, so that's where the big ambitious goal of starting a very right. big uh, company is there from the college days right. onwards. In fact, like there was a time where I I thought not of sitting in placements ah, okay. and start something, just start something. Mm -hmm. But I didn't have that guts to really do that. And right. uh, and ISRO came, and then I just followed my passion and right. then went into ISRO. Yeah. Uh, so always, even at ISRO, there was always back of my mind I want to start a company. Right. You know? So that is always ringing in the back of the mind. But of course, I was very, 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 very uh, probably I would say immersed in. Uh, uh, my work at ISRO. Uh, literally, I was enjoying it so much. Uh, I got a lot of appreciation. In fact, I was known as this cu curious kid who joined and, you know, I used to ask a lot of questions to everybody, you know, and a lot of people used to love interacting with me there. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I had a really good uh, time there and right. I used to, in fact, uh, even though I was in the integration team, I yeah. spent a lot of time learning other systems, yeah. you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, right down to the fundamental design. In fact, I studied like uh, hundreds of uh, rockets designed globally. I, because there was a beautiful library there, I used to, you know, read a lot. Why I used to compare why this rocket design is like this, why PSLV is like this, and etc. etc. So through that process of just my own fascination, right. I was so deeply immersed that in mm -hmm. fact, a lot of weekends I used to just right. spend, uh, you know, reading about rockets and more and more about beyond. Literally, probably I used to spend a lot of time reading beyond what right. I was actually doing. Mm -hmm. But I used to connect the dots. Yeah. That's where because everything finally comes to integration. We have to build the vehicle right. and then launch. I was part of the last leg of all the testing. You know, right. the rockets are uh, have very harsh environments. Right. So you know, to test them to you know vibration, shock, you know right. thermal and all these things. I was part of all these tests. So I saw the entire journey of building a rocket right. from scratch to a launch. I think you mentioned you know some very important points, which are again I think you know very very important for anyone aspiring for impact. You demonstrated curiosity. You know, you went beyond your job, which was integration that you did a bit of a random walk in terms of understanding about many different things, which are perhaps not even directly related to your work at the time, but I'm pretty sure came in, you know, very handy later on. Yeah. You also probably said you went deeper and deeper, right? So that is a journey of, you know, mastery that you were trying to develop a depth of understanding. Perhaps many of your colleagues might not have had, you know, that could not have had overnight, but after studying mechanical engineering for five years, then working ISRO for another six years. So 11 year, you are going deeper and deeper into mechanical engineering, rocket systems, many yeah. parts of that thing, I think. And then again, I'm sure last five, six years, now that you know you have got 17, 18 years of studying rocketry in a lot of detail, right? which is yeah. where, which is absolutely critical for you know any mastery journey. Yeah, yeah, yes, I right. think that's so. So now just going back to, so uh, I know you started in 2018, but when did you first think about seriously yeah. that I'm going to start and how do you think about having a co-founder or not having a co-founder? Yeah. So, in fact, just a few months before, you know, so in fact, I got a thought slightly earlier as well, but uh, I thought it is not possible. In fact, honestly, I thought it is too difficult because I was closely watching uh, the, you know, the entire process. Uh, but but then, like, that, sh that thought that, uh, you know, whether we can build a rocket company from India, uh, even though the, for the moment I felt that it's impossible because I was really closely observing how complex it is. 
uh, uh, you know, but still slowly, slowly, you know, I started realizing with time, you know, because my mind is totally focusing on the really feasibility, whether it's really feasible, because that is a very fascinating thing if you can build a rocket company uh, from India. So then slowly, slowly with time, I realized that it's feasible. Do you recall, it was it 2016, 17 when? No, no, it will be probably, you know, 2017 okay. time frame. Right. Yeah, yeah. And it was just more like a thought. Okay. And in fact, that was the time where I decided to, uh, in fact, mentally I was deciding to continue my entire life in ISRO and retiring. You know, because uh, most people do that, you know, every, everybody in ISRO, they have the entire journey in ISRO and then, you know, they retire. Uh, you know, I also wanted to have that same journey because I love the work so much. You know, but this thought came up. Uh, and then I also been observing globally, you know, SpaceX, you know, Rocket Lab and different, different uh, right. uh, companies, you know, building great stuff yeah. across the world. Uh, and then that started reiterating. So it, it can be done. And then when I saw this problem deeply, when I looked at right. this problem deeply and realized that it's totally possible. Of course, right. there are a lot of uh, puzzles to solve, right. but it is solvable uh, problem is what I felt. Yeah. In the moment I felt, I think just within a few months. Uh, so I want to zoom in, you know, I think I remember receiving an email from you in yeah. 2018. Yeah. And maybe I should share, share something with you, you probably don't know. So I think, you know, we've all been watching, you know, what Space, SpaceX was doing in the world. Yeah. And 2016, when I left Flipkart and started CureFit, I thought about various things. And somewhere deep down, I had this ambition of, you know, can, can I do something, you know, deep tech, long-term impact? But to be honest, you know, I had no context in deep tech or expertise and ended up doing something in different health space. But that was a kind of unfinished desire. Okay. And then I see, you know, in my inbox, there's an email saying, hey, you know, uh, I think so from, from you, we are, you know, ex ISRO engineers, we are thinking of building a rocket company. I'm like, wow, that's very fascinating, you know, at least it's worth a conversation. But I want to first tell you like your journey until the moment you send me that email, yeah. like, like when did Bharat join you? Yeah. How did you even think of, you know, sending me that email? And yeah. Just... yeah, yeah. So, so in fact, uh, uh, you know, as I mentioned at a particular point of time, I decided that, you know, it is time to uh, move on and start the company. And that's when I uh, I, I reached out. Uh, in, in fact, not uh, I have not directly reached out. So I have a friend called Balaji. In fact, mm -hmm. uh, he has sent a message, LinkedIn right. message to you, and uh, you responded. And then we were very happy that right. you know uh, 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 you know it was a very quick response. And then we thought like you know definitely there's good excitement. Right. And uh, we came to uh, meet you. And by the time, in fact, I already pitched to Bharat. And uh, yeah, and uh, in fact, like Bharat and me were colleagues at Isro. Uh, you know, for, in fact, we were flatmates. We were, uh, you know, having dinner together almost daily and we were very close friends and, uh, and I felt that, you know, he had the right aptitude uh, and also good synergy because I'm a mechanical engineer right. and he's an electronics engineer. Yeah. But even today, you know, I look at the mechanical aerospace right. propulsion aspects yeah. and he look, uh, looks after uh, the electronics software right. part of the rocket, you know. Yeah. So, it's so a good synergy uh, right. and the right aptitudes uh, matched and uh, right. uh, minds also match really well. Even today, we're like we're really best friends. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, that's why I, I immediately consciously felt he would be the right partner mm -hmm. to start with. Right. And pitched to him, and he felt it exciting. Right. Uh, and then, um, and then, like uh, we were, uh, he, were, he was also like onboarded, and uh, uh, you know, uh, quite excited to start this journey. And that's when, like, we met you, uh, you know, together. And then that that was the, probably the real kickoff uh, for our journey. Yeah, I remember meeting you at that we work in Goromangla. Yeah. And uh, do you remember again? I mean, now the uh, memory of that meeting is very vague in my head. What do you remember from that meeting? Uh, yeah, in fact, like I was very excited to meet you because I myself uh, was a, a big uh, Mintra fan. You know, in fact, I used to buy a lot of stuff from Mintra. That was my sh shopping <laughs> place. Then I, when I came to know that, you know, uh, a Mintra founder has uh, shown interest in meeting. Right. I was more interested to meet you. I don't know what, <laughs> what is going to turn up, but I was like quite interested to just meet and see the thought because at that time I was also like wanting uh, to, you know, build a very reasonably good company. Sure. And you already built, you know, such mm -hmm. a good successful company. Thought definitely some insights right. will be there to, uh, you know, learn from you. But also, like, I'm a fan of Mantra as well. Mm. You know, so that, that's when, like, I was very excited, came to, uh, you know, meet you. And then we had a conversation. Hardly, I think, uh, it was supposed to be, like, a half an hour conversation. It went on to be probably, I think, an hour conversation. And, uh, I mean, I was really connected, actually, with you. That during the meeting, etc. I felt that, okay, I think the mindsets are matching. And then uh, he has re uh, really passion and uh, for the space, etc. And also, because you're an entrepreneur, before you understand our excitement uh, initially, so that, I think that uh, frequency match was there and I was very excited uh, that, you know, if at all you come on board, I think it'll be a good kickoff for us. And uh, and then post coming out, not only all, we were surprised and very excited because mm -hmm. we showed interest in the first sure. meeting itself. Right. And in fact, we have seen uh, uh, every investor either is the first meeting right. or it doesn't happen. That's right. You know? That's right. So I think the same thing happened yeah. uh, uh, with us. Yeah. And... Uh, 
Uh, and then like uh, uh, we were very excited and surprised uh, yeah. mix mix feelings when we uh, came mix feelings yeah yeah, yeah. okay but uh, yeah, because we didn't expect that it is going <laughs> okay. to turn out you know right. uh, that uh, it will be turn out into an investment kind yeah. of a thing i think one thing i recall from that meeting i, I don't know whether the first meeting is the second yeah. but we had one conversation about you know really doing this for long term together yeah, yeah absolutely right and i think for me that was a uh, I mean, obviously, you guys had the expertise. Yeah. But I think when we talked about that, you know, something like building rockets will take very long period of time. Yeah. yeah. Can you guys? I think I remember asking you, uh, "Can you guys do this for ten years?" I think you replied, "We will do it for rest of our lives." Yeah. yeah. And that, I think, for me, you know, yes, the deal was yeah. sealed at that point. <laughs> wow. Yeah. In fact, when I say that frequency was matching, that's what I felt because we knew that it is a long term play, and and you fundamentally understood that it's a long term play. Yeah. You know, that was the match we had because we didn't want like. Uh, I mean, if somebody was excited with the business opportunity, right. it would have been a different uh, flavor altogether. Right. You know, if somebody was uh, excited with the vision, that's that would be more like a partnership, is what right. we thought. And I think it was a. Uh, I mean, in fact, very lucky. I would say a lot of lucky events, like you know, the U-turn in my school, and then in the college, yeah. and then getting into ISRO. Then I feel that one of the U-turn is like meeting you. Excellent. Yeah. You know, overall, glad you yeah. think that way. Yeah. And um, yeah, I think uh, for me, I think you know, just. I mean, uh, seeing you know the dedication, commitment, passion both you yeah. and Bharat had, and somewhere I also felt that you know India will have private space industry will rise. Only unknown was whether it takes you know two years, five years, ten years or longer, but it was kind of inevitable. Yeah. So I think with that conviction, conviction you know I decided to back, and I think I'm glad you know how the journey went. But I also want to make a point about uh, you know the two again you know in your story the two important things are coming out. You know, one is. You were letting go of your safe, secure job at ISRO. Yeah. You could have, you know, you were doing very well. You go, you could have continued to grow, get promotions, you know, get to maybe very senior level, you know, retire with dignity and so on, right? So letting that go for, I mean, what we initially did was the funding was very small. I think about a million dollars or so, from what I'm recalling, right? There's hardly any money to build a rocket company, yeah. but you are willing to let go of, you know, that so that risk appetite and st- stepping into completely uncomfortable zone. Building, you know, company from scratch that too in this category, and second, even that time thinking long term, yeah. you know, ten to twenty years ahead, but both are incredibly important, you know, for anyone starting wow. or any kind of impact journey. Yeah, it is. You knew that you had that kind of risk appetite, or it was a new discovery for you? Uh, yeah. So, so in fact, like risk appetite was always uh, quite high, but here it it it, it was uh, as I mentioned from the school and college itself, you know, wanted to become an entrepreneur, but here, as I told, right, I got the thought much earlier. But really, actually, uh, uh, took uh, is like solving a math problem. I saw, uh, you know, connected the dots. Of course, understood these were the risks which can be solved. And then once I did the analysis, I found this more like an opportunity. You know, which once lost will be lost forever. And no entrepreneur would want to lose such an opportunity. And the moment then it was like liberation. You know, in fact, from the mindset of wanting to, uh, you know, retire at ISRO, you know, I felt uh, typically it should be like probably a very a very sad coming out, you know, but it was more like liberation that, okay, I, I was choosing the right path at that point of time. And uh, I, it's a very uh, diff- different kind of uh, mindset at that point of time, actually. Yeah. Okay, Pawan, now I want to focus on first few years of, you know, Skyroot. In fact, starting 18, uh, 2018, so we closed the initial, you know, very tiny amount of seed funding. What happened in first 12 months? Yeah, so in fact, uh, <clears throat> we raised like 1.5 million, around 10 crores at that time. Um, uh, for a, it might be small for a rocket company. It's actually quite b- big for a seed round in India at that point of time. Actually, it's quite uh, um, and deep tech. It was like I think the best round at that point of time. Right. So it qu- was quite a revolutionary round, I would say, at that point of time. Mm-hmm. And we had uh, enough capital which lasted for two, two and a half years. Right. <laughs> you know. Right. So so we had a small team. Uh, so what we did is that we wanted to do it very fast, right. and that was the mindset uh, at that point of time. Yeah, maybe uh, I just interrupt you for a second and yeah. talk about that. You know, I did not think of it that way. Yeah, I invested because I was passionate yeah. about this area, and yeah. I liked you and Bharat. Yeah, but I think for deep tech, we need lot more of such investments. Yeah, and you are right that one to two million dollars may not be big in overall scheme of things. Yeah, but someone you know who is deeply committed, willing to give long term. Creating a two, two to three year runway, I think is very important, which a traditional VC ecosystem yeah. might overlook. I think so. It's very important. I'm starting to see some signs of that happening. Yeah. But we probably need a lot more of that. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. But basically. Yeah. And in fact, like uh, I also remember during our initial conversations just before the investment, 
uh, we were saying like you asked us like how much time it is going to take to uh, launch the rocket right you know we said two years <laughs> you know you said no no it's going to take five years right. <laughs> so we were like no no we'll do it in two years right. you know so so and it eventually happened in four and a half years you know so okay. that's a uh, so so you had that like right. uh, a long term outlook you know, it gave us a lot of comfort so yeah. that you know that may appear very prescient you know in retrospect yeah. but general rule of thumb in venture industries whatever entrepreneur says you double the time and double the money yeah. right then there is a good chance it'll happen right yeah. So, yeah. yeah so yeah so that's where like so our journey started with like 15 people we had like 15 people on day one uh, you know mostly like, isro people uh, no very few isro people like just one or two uh, isro people and we got it got people from uh, uh, you know from ancillary industries you know aircraft industry etc etc people with that technical skill sets but from a non rocket industry so we got them and some freshers was it there. difficult to hire oh, i mean So in fact like uh, that time i didn't know how but like we were able to get really good talent yeah uh, because probably we were on a direct hunt that time right. uh, and uh, we got really good first 30 people nice probably what we are today is because of those really good 30 people in fact some of them are venturing out and starting their own companies now right yeah, so that's yeah, a yes. biggest validation yes, yes yeah, yeah so you were able to attract high quality people high quality. early on early on and uh, so what that, was your pitch like you know if you say you're pitching to me yeah. hey you know, i'm just starting a rocket company come join work for me what yeah. will you say yeah so so in fact like that time the pitch was like uh, uh, yeah we are uh, we, we are starting a rocket company uh, will be the first time in the you know country and we have the investment and uh, it will be a great career growth for all of you people are not saying yeah right we'll see <laughs> no in fact surprisingly we had a good conversion rate you know and uh, yeah so that that's because like many people in the aerospace sector they are constrained with doing traditional works you know right. because there's no one building a rocket or so they were building an aircraft or something right. like that right mm-hmm. so so the core engineer in them really got excited right once such a thing came up right the really good ones because they have that spark they realize that is a great opportunity and then they took uh, in fact like we have not we don't even have a website to even for them to validate <laughs> they just came with a word of thought and on the first day we had 15 people in our uh, you know office and uh, we we start off with these people and then we eventually grew to like around 35 40 people and uh, before we raised the next round so i believe you have some people who are ex padam shri winners and yeah. an outstanding work isro can yeah. you talk about some of those yeah yeah so in fact like uh, one of the key people uh, is uh, uh, padma shri awardi mr gandhi gyan gandhi so he is like uh, he was the key uh, person for uh, developing cryogenic rocket technology in india and uh, so uh, in fact i happened to meet him at isro uh, during our days in fact he, he gives like wonderful lectures uh, on rocketry and uh, when we had our induction his talk was the highlight you know so from that time always they are like you know have to meet him etc and lucky was lucky to meet him at uh, isro and when we wanted to start up then like approached him you know right. because he is the key person in a key technology and uh, and uh, so we approached him and he was he took time to get convinced you know right. because he is a real rocket scientist and right. you know when he sees that you know private industry whether they can build everybody has the same right. doubts right. but then like when we showed the path mm-hmm. like you know this is what we are going to do this is where we are going to go this is how we are going to manufacture right. it this is the technology we are going to use this is the timeline we are going to take then he got you know very convinced because this really works he felt that really works and then that Uh, converted into a fascination for him and also like you know he has been like one of our uh, core people uh, over the last 5 years and you know phenomenal uh, people so like uh, like that we had uh, uh, you know we also have one uh, ex drdo scientist uh, from day one you know he is like one of the top experts in solid propulsion so that's uh, quite commendable right and also worth you know underlining again that you somehow you know managed to focus on building an outstanding team and attracted you know probably some of the best talent in the country you could find yeah. to come work for a, such an early stage company yeah yeah so so i i think like uh, that uh, uh, happened quite well in the first initial years and why it happened is because really they like the passion and the idea and the newness to it uh, and the uh, the most important thing which played is the feasibility you know right. the path that it is feasible no because nobody wants to spend years of their life on something that uh, will not work right. right so they believe that it is going to be feasible and they believe that their value add is going to make it feasible right. so that Uh, that puzzles were all solved during that interactions and they felt that you know this is going to happen we need to support and then we started so you know i'm really glad to one we are having this conversation to be honest just talking to you i am getting you know reinspired because i am thinking of you know next phase of my journey what kind of companies i want to do and there some this deep long term problem to be solved and the tendency is to you know pick easy problem you can solve you can do something in 2 years but i think it's great you know we are having the conversation i hope it inspires lot of people to you know pick up a really hard problem which will definitely will not get solved in india at some point 
but needs you know the starting point is one person who is really determined and yeah. want to you know make a difference so how did first two years at skyroot look like what do you guys work on first two years yeah so so because in fact we didn't have uh, too much money to build a lot of hardware right. you know but we had like a lot of money to complete all the designs right you know which was like the key intellectual property i would say you know so that was yeah. so we did most of it most of the rocket design we have completed in the you know first two how do you do rocket design do you use software use pen and paper <laughs> whiteboard how does one start the process <laughs> mix of all all of these you know so uh, in fact like uh, we just sketch out uh, typically you know sketch out the rocket right. this will be the diameter this will be the length this will be the material we do all those basic calculations then we do like very intense computer simulations you know with software and you know uh, and these are very expensive software so we could buy with this money few of them and we were like you know doing lot of simulations with that and then like step by step then we brought in experts for reviewing these designs fine tuned it you know it was it was iterative is like, the iterative. the physics and the simulation yeah. like is it really complicated uh yeah so uh it is complicated but uh, it, it's it physics by the end of the day you know so it's all physics at the end of the day and uh, it's uh, solving equations solving the uh, you know uh, fundamental so so rock just imagine 1969 man landed on moon right you know so 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 the tech has already been solved yeah. but the point is that it needs to be rebuilt we can right. say like which with very few people knowing the tech yeah. so we have to reinvent the wheel sometimes and we need to you choose the right architecture right. sometimes but it was like a very uh, and in fact it is we realized that uh, we underestimated rocket science when we started up right. you know in the journey we started appreciating more mm. and we realized that rocket science is rocket science right. but it was 10 times more difficult than what we thought you know it took like uh, uh, you know four times the time what we right. thought and it took like twice the capital what we thought right. and everything was mm -hmm. <laughs> exceeding and the, one of the biggest revelation is that really complex tech and main reason is that you can test a rocket only when it is flying that's the only way you can completely test a rocket so everything has to be pitch perfect that's right. how the rocket succeeds right. so it's a different kind of art to it and uh, that's what makes it real rocket science because mm -hmm. literally any small and also the margins are very very thin right you know it's hardly you just imagine 10% 5% right. margins in most of the components yeah. even slight changes the rocket will you know like so okay i want to ask you like probably very you know um, uh, um the question maybe a lot of audience will relate to is someone who has studied you know high school physics yeah. understand you know, newton's three laws of motion and knows the gravitational formula and laws of thermodynamics maybe yeah. how much can they understand how does your rockets work oh no i think they can understand everything yeah 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 so so literally it's it's if you break down everything yeah it's few fundamental equations right. in fact there is a major equation called rocket uh, equation yeah you know it was early you know very very old equation is there a way for you to explain the equations so somebody like me can understand uh, the equation yeah okay yeah i think uh, so see every rocket is nothing but as i mentioned right the end the end goal is giving velocity to something Yeah. so here in this case satellite yeah. give a velocity of like 7.8 km per second and it orbits around the earth right so so the rocket equation starts with the velocity it's called delta v okay uh, change the velocity okay change in velocity why change in velocity because the earth already has velocity right you know that's the reason why what happens is that when you launch from the equator yeah you know because earth is rotating yeah. equator has a maximum velocity yeah and, and you launch from the equator It's you know, something like 500 meter per second yeah, or something recorded right yes 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 around i think 4 uh, 462 meter per okay, you need to be more precise i can use round yeah, numbers <laughs> yeah so around that yeah. you know it's around 500 meter per second it's a half a kilometer per second right. already uh, yeah. you know uh, at the equator yeah. right so so when you launch the rocket it starts with that velocity typically so that's what what we are interested in the delta v beyond that how much you want to get into orbit so that's where the rocket equation starts with delta v sure you know so delta v equals ejection velocity mm -hmm. you know so uh, that means ejection velocity is the rocket as the plume when you test the rocket yeah. it has an ejection uh, right. you know velocity the plume coming out yeah. basically so uh, rocket actually works in the newton's third law right you know so that means every like every action has equal reaction and opposite reaction yeah. here the action is like you you throw, eject something out eject something and it pushes out, you it then it pushes you up right right so the velocity of ejection is very important in right. getting that velocity yeah. so that's what the equation says delta v equals to right. ejection velocity into logarithmic of uh initial mass by final mass that means initial mass of the rocket yeah. divided by final mass of the rocket the more the ratio the more the delta v is going to get the more the ejection velocity the more delta v is going to get it's a very simple equation and the reverse of that if you want to have uh the higher the payload yeah. the initial you know mass needs to keep going up proportionally yes yes yeah yeah so 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 uh, so this is like the most basic equation typically and uh, what happens is as you increase the payload yeah. this ratio changes right. because initial mass by final mass right so so because of this ratio changes you get less delta v right so you can only launch a certain 
a certain payload with this uh, particular mass yeah. so that's what uh, yeah happens. great look i'm able to follow along at least 80% of it and the reason i'm talking about see like in a lot of people people prepare for je and stuff right and go through this physics and learn how to solve the equation but this is a real world application of at least conceptual level yeah. not very advanced physics i understand material science of it aerodynamics yeah. of it yeah. you know a lot of those computations are extremely complex yeah. but i work on a very simple physics that pretty much you know every high school student in the country learns you'll not believe even when we uh, uh, architect a new rocket yeah. right uh, so our uh, rocket stage designer trajectory designer he makes these basic calculations on paper right. and says these are the number of stages required this is the delta we required for each right. stages So it so it's as fundamental right. to that you know and the complexity comes in uh, building the bringing all those atoms together right. to build the rocket which will succeed right. so that's where the complex so let's let's get into that part so first two years you guys focused on getting the designs right yeah. uh, you did the virtual simulation using software yeah. etc yeah yeah um at what point did you actually in you know, a process of uh testing the components yeah. and putting the physical rocket together start yeah and also what enable that yeah sure so so uh, basically uh, uh, the smallest as a rocket right to lift off you need very large engine yeah. you know because the rocket weight is very high you need a very large engine yeah. then that stage separates and then the next stage you need less thrust yeah. so the last stage of the rocket actually has very less thrust mm-hmm. and it is so that's why it's small right so we thought like you know with this capital we going to build uh, the upper stage engine okay. you know which is which is definitely equally complex right. so very complex engine yeah. and we'll test it and we did that uh, during that time after 2 years of the journey we developed that and just like covid hit and uh, you know a few months after covid we were somehow were able to uh, complete the testing of the engine and that was like the first uh, you know full uh, engine test ever in the country uh, rocket engine test by the private sector right. you know so that uh, in fact we named it after uh, uh, raman you know uh-huh. our, uh, dr c v raman <laughs> right so so we named all our engines dr. after dr c v raman was the first i think nobel prize winner out yes. of country yeah, right in yeah, physics yeah 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 and then so so in uh, so so basically to honor our great scientists you know uh, after several years you know we had that scientific temperament because of these kind of scientists so we named the engine as raman and we successfully test fired it and that was first shot success i mean we yeah. never imagined and it was using new technology and where exactly did you test if you are able to share yeah so it's at a government facility okay. uh, which is uh, uh, you know which is uh, very very difficult to get uh, uh, you know access to and uh, some of were able to test at the uh, you know uh, secure government facility and uh, so that was like a very historic uh, testing and it gave us good confidence and in fact uh, what is different is that we used very new technology we used 3d printing for yep. which was never used what uh, what was 3d 3d printing so by an injector so okay. basically the injector uh, typically has several parts yeah. uh, you know injector is uh, what the uh, when the propellants come in right? right it mixes them and pushes into the rocket chamber right right so this this needs very uh, complicated you know swirls yeah. etc and you have to swirl the uh, you know propellant and atomize it a lot of it has a lot of detailing in inside that and uh, so those two propellants we have are called hypergolic that means if they touch each other they start fire you know by any chance if there is a leak there is a burst typically you know the two propellants have to come together but should not mix at any point of time small leak you have a burst so so that way uh, what we did we 3d printed it and with both the channels internally to the uh, you know the injector and uh, so we were able to get much more better efficiency than a traditional uh, kind of an uh, injector and it was like very good uh, right. test which happened and as you started you know designing this component and testing i think you brought in some extra or uh, some other partners as well right you know yeah. some investors and some of your industrial houses can you just talk about yeah how did that journey correct. unfold correct so so i think uh, little less than 2 years down the journey and uh, we happened to meet uh, solar industry solar industries is like right now the largest explosives manufacturer in the world in the world from india just imagine I mean, you know it comes from nagpur right and uh, I, i really moved by the kind of story they have yeah. and uh, so they were like one of the very few uh, early two players who manufacture rocket propellant in the country and the supply it for both the space and the defense well, yeah some point i had to convince them to be on this podcast because i mean they are virtually not known anywhere right and yeah. the you know largest in this particular industry in the world okay. is you know quite commendable yes yes and and i think so they were one of the early supporters for you yes they were one of the early supporters in fact because they have the propellant manufacturing we went them went to them as like they're going to become a vendor to us right that's when we went and started talking to right. them and uh, they are a very large player and yeah. you know very entrepreneurial uh, uh, you know in mindset and in fact i think when they were investing in us i think they were valued at a billion dollars or so now they are like over 4 billion dollars and the largest in the world in that segment 
so i think they have grown like phenomenally like you know as a startup like a startup they have grown so they have that kind of a, a great mindset and they immediately connected to what we are building mm-hmm. and they felt that they can add value to it and they have all the infrastructure ready to test these rocket engines manufacture part of it and test uh, them so we felt it's a great partnership to have and also early supporters and also coming from you know people who have built like a very successful company over several and they came in as an investor as well right yes yes they came in as an investor so the vendor conversation you know converted into an investor conversation and they finally you know they invested in skyroot and even now like many of our tests happen at their facilities right. and around this time uh, you probably started reaching out to broader yeah. sort of investors yeah how did that journey go like what is your recollection of how many investors you would have approached and how many people would have either said no or not even written back a response uh, yeah so i think we have uh, met several hundreds of investors several hundreds literally i think almost all the investors uh, Uh, available you know which we were able to reach out to almost all the uh, venture all the vc firms you know uh, most many even angels as well you know so uh, literally almost all we because uh, we, we had to spread our wings uh, high and we reached out to almost everybody and uh, uh, and then like we realized that uh, there was no thesis for space right and they were learning most of them were learning so we had multiple conversations but uh, so you are going to educate all these vc educate, firms about educate, the space industry yeah, educate uh, uh, most of the uh, you know investors and it was a good conversation because like you know they were building the thesis for space you know they were also observing the journey how what did happen etc etc and also at that point of time you know what happened when we started off uh, there was like um, uh, a, a company wanting to launch a moon lander right you know? and uh, so unfortunately even though they have progressed well right. couldn't make it yeah. you know because of that there was like a uh, the talk in the industry that you know right. this, this is a very difficult it's too complicated complicated and, right. and then you know let's not yeah. so take it's too much risky that kind of mindset is there so everywhere we well uh, we went they already had a formed mind you know so already had a formed mind already the industry is risky and there was no thesis so this was an environment where we were raising funds literally and we had to raise something like a 10 million dollars right. kind of a check at yeah. that point of time right so then we started like reaching out to lot and lot of investors yeah. and uh, and uh, l- luckily we met like like we met you we met anil uh, yeah. who is the founder of greenco uh, uh, and uh, so they built like india's largest renewable energy company it's a, a, and based out of hyderabad and uh, and luckily we were able because in the same city able to reach out and then uh, they put in both the founders of greenco anil and mahesh they put in 7 million dollars you know and then like uh, we had solar industries also right. participating and then we had we built a 11 million dollar round right. uh, you know with that so so that was also like a, a vision investment from an right. entrepreneur yeah. you know so uh, still like vc industry uh, was uh, you right. know observing the so sector. at this stage you were probably 3 year into your journey yes yeah you talked to several hundred investors yes, yeah all of them said no to you yeah no really hurts right every day someone does no you wonder whether something wrong with me something wrong with my company maybe the space is not right and yeah. how did you take all those nos yeah and yet maintain your commitment to you know continue in this journey yeah so uh, so it was in fact like one of the most painful phases i would say during the skyroot journey uh, you know because it's like you know at some point we wondered me and bharat used to sit and wonder are anybody going to even fund us mm. you know because uh, so that is the kind of uh, thought you know we had big dreams and you know everything going well uh, you know we knew that this is going to work yeah. but are we going to get the large investments which we are looking at right know? so that was a big doubt we had and lot of stress that uh, put us in a good amount of st- uh, stress until the uh, investment come in and it was uh, whatever investment we raised was at that point of time the largest in the sector you know so basically we were basically uh, 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 you know breaking the glass ceiling at each round right, right? so that was a very uh, Uh, you know tough phase i would say it took longer than we expected you know you were also there part of the journey so it it took much longer than what what right. we expected finally it ha- uh, happened uh, right. quite well and uh, and also it happened in a very bad phase i would say in right. probably in covid everything right. everybody is like you know yeah. <laughs> in a very bad scenario of the economy it happened and right. uh, quite grateful for that uh, round and the kind of support yeah. right so 3 years into it you managed to close this 10 million and 11 million dollar round you've yeah. got you know two large industrial houses now backing you yeah and through them you also got access to good facilities but by this time the government also started to support you yeah you started getting access to their facilities yeah so right. just uh, just walk me through you know how did that environment change during this yeah. period yeah so so uh, what happened is during covid you know so uh, most of us entire country was depressed right. <laughs> what was going to happen <laughs> right to the economy etc etc you know it was we don't know what is going to the, uh, you know. uh, so in fact uh, looking back we have probably imagined worse so scenarios at that time in the mind you know so uh, in that scenario was not as in as you did you think about shutting down the company at any point uh, no i mean uh, not so definitely we knew that you know we're going to like uh, 
uh, continue whatever even if you are small we're going to just continue so you had that belief that no matter what happens we will continue because anyway the phase is going to right. pass and we had that conviction that we're going to you know stay right. long it's it's a long game anyway so so that way like uh, we knew that but we, we knew that like there is a chance that we may not scale the way we want you know and we may not get the capital which we wanted that phase you know because that that is the time where designs were ready we need to hire larger team and you know we have to bring that hardware out as well we are like years delayed right yeah. so it was very important round to happen right. and it was taking very long than what we expected and uh, in that time what happened was uh, uh, government announced several reforms right. several reforms because you know covid is already the economic scenario right. is very bad the several reforms related to space industry related to multiple industries and space was part of it including space you know and then that was a big moment of celebration that you know finally the government has it has been in talks but uh, you know like you said right we never know it's going to take two years five years yeah. never knew but so can you talk about what was the reform yeah. so, yeah. so the reform was that even though we were building testing engines etc etc we cannot launch a rocket to space without a policy right you know because uh, the rocket launching is a very involved activity the nation is involved you know where like for example if the rocket goes in the wrong direction there's liability involved it needs a policy framework you know and uh, it needs a license whether the rocket even is in uh, worth launching is also the government has to decide so you started building this company without any clarity yeah whether you will ever be allowed to actually launch a rocket in space yeah yeah but somewhere you had the conviction that you know the path will open up yes yes so 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 we are very convinced that it's a chicken and egg problem you know so without companies the policy is not going to be fierce enough and uh, without policy you cannot like grow enough so so they both have to merge sometime and then it may take 2 years 5 years 10 years you know honestly it came before than what we right. what i expected personally definitely before what i expected i was not expecting to happen yeah. at least 5 to 7 years before yes yeah so we were lucky probably in the covid in a way helped in accelerating that transformation uh, from the government announcing all the policies and then that started uh, uh, the entire uh, you know opening up of space sector where now Uh, the government will give licensing right. you know it takes care of the liabilities right. you know, etc etc for launching and then there's a framework for launching right. without which you cannot launch a rocket right so by 2020 you know government is starting to create these reforms yeah you know create this licensing mechanism yeah you got your series a i guess funding of 11 million dollars yeah what was the actual process of building a rocket you know can you just explain yeah. how do you build a rocket you buy parts start assembling what happens <laughs> yeah yeah okay so so in fact the rocket we built uh, mostly is built with carbon fiber it's like the lightest material ever so so we uh, get that in form of you know spools like threads kind of a thing so you start building a rocket with this yeah, and i have a club seen in your facility so there's yeah. a big spool of just like just uh, threads right yeah yeah and you start building rocket from there okay yeah 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 correct how, yeah, so how do you go how do you how do you do that yeah so so what what we do is that uh, uh, you know basically this spool has to convert into a structure right right so we is precisely wind the rocket uh, you know over a tool okay uh, you know which is shaped uh, like a rocket right. and uh, that that tool itself takes several months to build actually it's very complex with there's build from like pop or yeah it is built with multiple materials okay. you know first there's a very large steel shaft yeah. which is very very high precision uh, uh, you know micron level precision right. and, and then like on that you put some you know the various surfaces create that shape and then on that you start uh, you know winding with precision again you know slight deviation is going to because the margins are just 10% you know so you know, that that means like, let's say you know the rocket has to take uh, uh, 100 atmospheres of pressure you know you design that for like 110 atmospheres right. you know slight deviation is gone right. right so it has to be so precisely done and uh, it has to and many people uh, spend uh, probably several years you know even mm-hmm. mastering that craft right. and may not be able to succeed as well yeah. so so uh, all these complexities are there right and uh, so we were able to you know build our own uh, you know in house software you know which is a very good at building you know uh, uh, rockets the code which runs which makes the machine build that uh, part this is one of the key parts like that there are like thousands of parts how many thousands i mean i have not counted but you <laughs> know de- definitely in uh, a few you know maybe few of thousands like less than around 5000 of uh, parts maybe there in the entire rocket wow. yeah. yeah yeah and yeah. all of those parts i mean how many of them you had to make from scratch versus yeah. we yeah. will buy from some so so everything is designed from scratch and uh, and many thing uh, one very good thing about india is that uh, because of isro uh, uh, you know we had that uh, decades of uh, uh, you know experience in the vendor ecosystem you know because almost if you see 80% of pslv is manufactured outside of isro right so that kind of ecosystem already exists so yeah. we utilized uh, that uh, expertise already available in the ecosystem yeah. and then they used to manufacture them we used to design them right. we used to go there manufacture them still they're complex right. they unhold handhold them 
you know etc etc but still it's a, a big process of building a space qualified park it's it's, it's really pain it takes years to build a qualified space park and any component you touch in a rocket it takes like typically on average one year to build one to two years to build and qualify yeah. i think as i'm you know listening to your journey unfold i'm realizing i'm a reminder of this thing i think i think ravindranath tagore has this you know poem ekla chalo re but the point is you know you start alone and slowly people start joining you in your case you know you and bharat started yeah and some you know slowly you got some investors you got these industrial houses yeah. you even have government of india started to open up their space and yeah. you know open up their space policy yeah. and you have all these vendors you know which are there for you to yeah. so coming back to so you start you know how long did this whole process take to assemble test all these you know 5000 parts and when did you really feel you are going to be able to actually attempt a launch yeah so uh, uh, in fact uh, uh, just two years uh, I, i think i remember like uh, in uh, december of 2020 is when we decided to build uh, a rocket called vikram s our first rocket which is going to launch to space and then uh, that's when we started uh, designing it uh, a new fresh rocket so whatever we were designing from day one was our orbital rocket which is you know targeting to launch right. uh, year end and uh, so this was a new rocket which we need to build right. all of a sudden and uh, so this has this doesn't have thousands of components but it has like several hundreds of components you know but equally complex components and smaller the more complex actually you know smaller ones are more intricate and you know quite complex to build so uh, so we built a rocket which is uh, two storied building top you know it's like around 6 meters tall yeah. uh, and uh, so that we named it as vikram s right. and we named the launch mission as praram Right. because we 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 thought it is like it's a great beginning for Absolutely. indian space sector yeah. and uh, so from when we started off we thought like under a year we going to launch you know so that was the mindset in which uh, uh, you know we wanted to uh, we took it up and uh, you know typically it, it took two years uh, to completely do and in fact we realized that the design was more complex than we thought because it needs a lot of iteration anything goes wrong it's going to you know end up in a problem yeah. and uh, this huge amount of heat as the rocket goes right. up right huge amount of heat huge amount of stress huge amount yeah. of vibration mm-hmm. all that you know design an entire rocket components to this is like right. not easy yeah. and uh, when we are building the first parts always there will be some issue we have to fix and you know it's that keeps prolonging 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 and uh, so finally we thought like a few months uh, you know we will be able to launch it took 2 years uh, and then a uh, lot of uh, you know faced a lot of complications in the you know systems when we built and tested and all that right. and then the policy was also like parallelly coming with us right. and that is even first time for the policy in fact uh, the, uh, the the headquarters of the authorizing agency was just opened 5 months before our launch okay <laughs> yeah. wow. so this is in space in space yeah, right yeah yeah, yeah yeah can you just explain in more detail what is in space when yeah. did government start and with for what intentions yeah so so in space is a regulatory body mm-hmm. you know so it 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 not only regulates but in addition to regulation it also promotes mm-hmm. and handholds the private industry right. in this uh, so now we have department of space you know and there is isro one of the key members and now the in, in space is another key member you know isro takes care of governmental launches and all the government space program and in space takes care of all the private uh, the space program you know which are people are developing like us you know developing their own space systems and launching to space so th- so that's how uh, you know in space is built and uh, from the policy it came that you know it has to have a regulatory agency right. the regulatory agency is in space and the brought in like one of the top uh, you know industry uh, stalwarts yeah. like uh, dr pawan goenka who led mm-hmm. mahindra and mahindra right. you know so he was brought in and uh, he was not from the space sector right. you know so they wanted fresh perspective uh, who understands industry so that's where uh, on his leadership uh, in space was started so it it was a very fresh way of forming an organization and it was more like a startup again you know with very few people and uh, so they uh, and first license they ever gave for a rocket is ours and they were in that journey uh, you know initially and uh, so it was a parallel journey so we're building the rocket we are also like interfacing with the government to establish norms and uh, you know and rocket rocket launch a rocket is one thing right getting the policy to launch a rocket is a right. different thing all together and i want to emphasize you know one very important point here is that see uh, for a innovation to happen you know entire ecosystem needs to thrive yeah and we have seen lot of signs of indian government itself being very entrepreneurial you know enabling these policies sometime at a very fast pace yes. you know yes. doing unconventional thing and you know laying the groundwork and i think from our understand both in space and isro has been incredibly supportive yeah and i think perhaps many other organizations that i am also not recalling yeah. Yeah. can just touch upon that aspect of the support you got from so, this ecosystem so so just imagine from a layman in india yeah. you know so there's no policy right new policy has been announced right. you know and you need to launch a rocket in few months right. for example yeah. you know and then the most when you just list on the risks 
know, the first risk would be getting the permissions on time, typically, because they're not established yet, right? So even when we were building our disk chart, you know, we realized that was the biggest risk. The rocket will be ready, but we may not get the licensing on time. Right, so this was the thought we were all had. I think the government has done a phenomenal job in busting that entire theory. Yeah. That you know, uh, and we were really surprised. And uh, in fact, as a uh, personally, as an entrepreneur, we try to look at all the you know possible scenarios uh, which can go wrong. Right. Even two weeks before the launch, I was mm -hmm. thinking there could be some issues and right. of the policy and all because right. so, you know all a lot of things have to come together. Yeah. You know, but still, like not even a single single day delay was there because of policy. You know, I think that is out, outstanding. I think outstanding. that's a you know yeah. representation of new India, yeah. where we are headed. I yeah. think uh, with all the you know, larger ecosystem innovation, even things like India Stack, etc., we'll talk yeah. you know later in this podcast. I think that uh, backdrop yeah. is can empower an you know, entrepreneur like you, where you can dream big, yeah. say something like really ambitious, ambitious, and expect you know the environment to be fully supportive. I want to come back to now your launch, and I know you know you are feverishly working on your first launch to get put actual satellites into orbit which is going to happen sometime but uh, you designed this Vikram S yeah. which was in some way a test launch yeah. to test some critical component and as we talked earlier I mean the launch was phenomenally successful celebrated all across India you know everyone was cheering for you know this launch to be successful and felt pride in that moment yeah. but just in terms of what were the key milestones in that you know what are some critical things you wanted to prove which I'm guess they are now proven and emboldened you now to Feverishly work on your next. So, so, so one of the key, basically, the heart of the rocket is the propulsion. Yeah. You know, the same propulsion technology we are using in the uh, the Vikram One, which we are going to launch uh, this year. So, the same technology is used in uh, Vikram S. Uh, you know, and then the structures. It is also one of the world's first few all carbon fiber built rockets. So, the, even the structure, the materials, everything got proven. And even the thermal, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, there is like specific coatings which are used in the rocket to preserve it from the heat. You know, so that also is proven, and a lot of electronics uh, inside the rocket. You know, uh, uh, you know, there is a uh, uh, you know, there is a data acquisition system which acquires all the signals in the rocket. Right. Telemetry system, you know, right. which beams it down to the you know Earth from uh, you know space. So all these systems, uh, uh, you know, got proven, and almost like eighty percent of the tech got uh, proven there. And the similar tech is going to scaled up in uh, Vikram One. And uh, and a lot of, in the journey we have uh, you know found a lot of we we have done a lot of iterations you know which made it better and the same things are used in right. uh, you know Vikram one. So after the successful launch, which was unprecedented because of you know was such a fast development trajectory, yeah, and the launch was celebrated all across India. I think everybody from politicians to celebrities to business houses, everyone was celebrating, congratulating you. How did first few months for you and your team? Yeah. Are in the aftermath of launch look like? I mean, I think it was like a, uh, a fairy tale <laughs> after <laughs> right. the launch. Yeah. Uh, you know, first thing is we were very relieved and, uh, you know, a lot of things were beyond expectations, I would say, like on the launch. And there was congratulations across the country. And I mean, literally, you know, the entire media was, uh, uh, you know, wanting to talk to us and, you know, and share the story with the country. And we were like several interviews in the next uh, few weeks, mm -hmm. uh, actually. And uh, and then like our team was in highest spirits, I right. would say, right. you know, because they saw this happen right before their eyes, which they have been building for years, right. and uh, it was in very high spirit. And then this team, just the small two hundred uh, you know people team, was celebrated across the country, you know. Yeah. So their parents, their relatives, you know, all of them were excited. So so this basically was celebrated as a national event, and uh, that gave us immense satisfaction as a team, as a company, and uh, you know. And and also we found that because we were a center of it, we didn't realize how big that was. You now slowly, slowly, as we got more and more feedback from people, we realized that this is much much bigger than what we imagined. Right. Uh, Your uh, you know, parents must have been incredibly proud. Huh? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. In fact, uh, they were watching it, uh, you know, live, and uh, they they were found very they were become very emotional, very proud, uh, etc. In fact, it was. Uh, uh, celebrated very well in our town and you know that place as well uh, you know so so that that way I think it was uh, celebration across and uh, typically rocket launch is common man gets connected to it you know it feels like something extremely complex and it's it's like you said you know it's, it's like rocket science and uh, everybody uh, loves watching a rocket launch typically so all that happened right before their eyes that took from a private sector Built with a very young team, right? Uh, yeah. And around the same time, you close, uh, I think, uh, fifty million dollar round yeah. with GIC, which yeah. is next level of glass ceiling. Yeah. yeah, That you guys broke. I think you are the best funded private space company in India, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. yeah. And now you have sufficient fund to plan 
um, you know, many more launches in the near future. Yeah. So can you talk about what does your journey for next four or five years look like? What are the critical milestones that you hope to achieve over next yeah. few years? So, so one of the most critical milestone is reaching orbit, you know. So typically, you know, that is considered as one of the toughest things uh, for any space company yeah. and hardly like very few companies were able to reach. So now we reach space. Yeah. Next is reaching orbit. Yeah. You know, orbit is like very, very, very few uh, companies have reached globally. Uh, and it it also shows like for example even SpaceX journey shows they had three attempts at orbit fourth attempt was successful you know three right. attempts failed and you know so let me get the right SpaceX you know we all know the very celebrated stories yeah but in 2000 I think six seven eight time frame yeah when they're trying to put their first satellite into orbit yeah. which we talked about earlier 500 kilometer orbit three successive failures yeah. And fourth, I think, you know, was successful because if it wasn't, SpaceX would have gone bust. Yes, yeah. And you're hoping to get there in one long, one attempt. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that that's the target. And, uh, you know, uh, definitely times have changed now and we have to get much better uh, right now. And uh, uh, and then, see, for us, there is uh, uh, that Indian, in, Indian, Indians have that frugal mentality, yeah. you know. We don't want to waste money. So, so, so definitely, I think uh, we have that feeling that we don't want to waste hardware. We know how expensive this is. If we don't want to de- to fail, you know that mindset is there from the beginning. You know, I, we are hopeful that you know that converts into the reliable mindset. Yeah. Of- and building on that, uh, can you estimate this ballpark? You know, how much capital you would have used until assuming your first launch or second launch is successful? Yeah. Versus, let's say, some of the other private space company yeah. in the world, what kind of capital they have consumed yeah. to get to same milestone? Yeah, so I, I mean like uh, it, it varies, but I would say that, you know, uh, there, there are companies who spend a billion dollars to get to orbit yes. while building a, a similar size of uh, rocket. Which Until will, their first launch in the orbit. Until the first launch. And uh, so we would, we would get there, uh, you know, I mean under $30 million. Incredible. So 30x yeah. efficient advantage, you know, that's how I think I'm pretty sure yeah. not only India will be very proud, and also a lot of entrepreneurs will, you know, think of space and other deep tech industries successfully, but also at the start of a just new industry. I think the the business potential of getting this right, I think for Skyroot and perhaps other companies also yeah. is going to be immense. Yes, absolutely. Yes. So, okay, now just fast forward. You know, assume, you know, you are able to do your orbital launch successfully, you know, whatever first attempt, second attempt, love to see it successful, first attempt itself. But yeah, we understand, you know, rocket science involves some, you know, tolerance for failure and so on. But after you've done that successfully, yeah. how does your journey, uh, Skyroot journey over next 10 to 15 years look like? Yeah, so I think, uh, so first is reaching orbit, you know, that is the first major milestone. And second, uh, and that is very, very difficult than the milestone which we have reached today, you know, reaching space. And even bigger, uh, difficult problem to solve beyond that is achieving profitability. Right. You know, so actually launch uh, customer rockets, mm-hmm. get the revenue, yeah. get enough margins and get them consistently. Yeah, most of the revenue will come from people who want to launch satellites. Launch satellites. Okay. Yes, yes, yeah. So, so that's where like, you know, streamlining the launches. And typically what happens is that if some launch fails in between, you may be grounded for six months, sometimes one year. You know, it's a very crazy industry. Yeah. So you have to have that reliability consistently. Right. You know, even the customer doesn't want to launch if the rocket fails, keeps yeah. failing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, so getting into profit, operational profitability is extremely difficult. Yeah. And for us, I think it's a blessing. You know, from India, as I mentioned, the phenomenal cost efficiency we have. Uh, so it, it makes a good business case. Uh, right. You know, for us and uh, achievable thing if everything yeah. goes well. So, but still, it's a very tough challenge because right. uh, you know, building it, we know, uh, you know, from the crux that you know, it's a very tough challenge. One thing is putting a rocket in orbit and putting it consistently. Second thing is to get, attract the right kind of launches and investor, I mean like uh, the customers consistently so that you get those margins. But the demand for satellite launch is growing around the world, right? Yeah. yeah. Can you just, how many satellites are in the orbit already as we speak? Uh, Yeah, I I think see, uh, previously, uh, uh, you know, when we started off, it was like around, I think 1500 satellites. 1500. 1500. Now it has, I think, uh, crossed uh, several thousands now. Several, several thousand, thousands, including the Starlink satellites? Including the Starlink, because yeah. that is major part of the satellites are now Starlink right. satellites, which yeah. SpaCX has launched, right. uh, you know, and several thousands have now. And what is the estimate? Uh, yeah, each, each year, roughly how many satellites are being launched now? Uh, I mean, a uh, few thousands. few right. thousands. Yeah, yeah okay. about so, thousand now. So it is accelerating. Yeah. Exactly. Over the next 10 years, we will see like... Yeah. Huge increase in number of Just satellites. Just imagine like, you know, when we started off, there were only 1,500 satellites, operation satellites. Now within a year, more than 1,000 satellites are getting launched, you know. And now it is going to increase further and further, you know. And last year, SpaceX has done 61 launches. 61 launches. So that means like more than one, one week. Yeah. A week, you yeah. know, and, uh, and many of the launches have like more than 30 satellites. Each. Right. I mean, like, it's like going crazy. So, yeah. I mean, that uh, augurs well for you, right? You know, because yeah. 
the as people want to launch more and more satellite yeah. they want reliable launch partners yeah. and assuming you are one of the you know foremost private player in the country hopefully a lot of that demand will flow to you yeah yeah so the, so that's the whole expect in fact more than 90% of our market is global you know so we have to compete with the best in the world you know to succeed and uh, so we have our own niches uh, you know building our own vehicles our own customer solutions etc etc uh and uh, so that's that's the, the journey which we need to crack you know how to build a profitable you know rocket company and once we go there i th- i think that is the time where uh, in fact if you see the mission statement of uh, skyroot opening space for all you know that is where is the foundation for really opening space for all okay you know talk to me more about that you know when you say opening space for all yeah in your wildest imagination yeah what do you think what is a true manifestation yeah. of this vision yeah so true manifestation is that you know all of us would for example do a holiday in space in space you know so now like probably your birthdays will be so that 10 years from now can i buy a ticket to go to space in one of the sky route yeah, rockets i think uh, 10 years from now if everything works well and we want to but to be honest like what do you like you know not yeah. to be very hyperbolic about it yeah what is a likely scenario where you can you know actually send a common man to space well, i think uh, uh, see uh, both uh, virgin galactic and you know uh, so blue origin blue origin they went yeah. launches already right. to suborbital space right. basically uh, to go to orbit and you know spend right. some time and come yeah. back right. you know is is uh, less than a decade away i, I feel yeah. so yeah yeah i think yeah so uh, but when we're starting booking for that <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> so you know you will be our one of our first customers i have to be when i was the first investor <laughs> he'll be hard yeah. broken if i am not the first customer yeah 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 and i'd also like you know basically we need to build confidence uh, enough that a person can sit on a rocket <laughs> you know we, we commonly people think that you know rockets are like you know not so reliable they keep you know bursting and you know anything can go wrong etc etc so to build that reliability it takes like several launches several hundreds of launches once we get to that kind of reliability right so this you know satellite launches you know i guess you will go from low earth orbit to geostationary yeah. perhaps you know some version of space tourism as well yeah but what we are you know space is yeah. humongous so like where where do we go like few decades out yeah so so basically uh, i mean um, earth resources you know uh, it'll be surprising to know that most of these resources actually come from space you know and we whatever we mine you know all those uh, heavy metals they actually come from meteor meteor strikes over you know several thousands of years uh, so literally space has all the resources you know and earth's resources are quite limited to sustain a very large civilization right and today i mean few billions of people on earth you know and it cannot sustain very large exponential growth for example 200 years ago earth's population was just a billion That's billion right. people mm-hmm. now there are 8 billion people right. you know just in 200 years we have grown 8x yeah. so we are an expanding civilization right. right at a particular point of beyond a particular point earth cannot sustain this expansion right. and as we are intelligent beings right. we have to expand yeah. and space is the next frontier and today we only think about earth we think earth is the economy it's all we know you know but but if you see all the economy is beyond earth you know literally everything you want just near earth asteroids have trillions and trillions in terms of water you know there's, there's trillions and trillions and tons of uh, uh, you know precious metals in space literally resources are immense and uh, right. infinite in space right. yeah so you have this potential uh, mining use cases from space yeah but what is the reality how far away from earth can you mine something on moon or do you have to go to nearby planets or like you know yeah. how far do you have to go yeah. where you can actually find something useful the rare earth metals yeah. and bring back yeah so so uh, so literally uh, the whole idea is not to bring back actually okay. you know so if you bring back you not expand beyond a particular thing it's called in situ utilization you know sure. so you have a outpost in space whether it's in orbit whether it's moon mars yeah. and use the resources of that planet right. to sustain there right. you know so that's where like you can expand to uh, you know probably a, t- a trillion human beings beyond earth and space is the next frontier so that's where it happens and and only one problem to be solved low cost access to space and that is rockets and and even today without space we cannot live just if you switch off space services is gone you cannot aircrafts cannot fly you know you cannot navigate on earth 90% of the earth surface has no communication right so literally you know without space we cannot live uh, today and we have very little access to space no, absolutely how many uh, rocket companies are there in the world who have had at least one successful launch yeah. to you know in space yeah so i mean less than 10 you know in the, whole world. in the whole world yeah not the not counting the government agencies and government also probably under 10 yes that's all just yeah. 20 organization government and private and you are one of them yes yeah that has to be an extremely rare situation to be and that to 
just five year after you know you're starting up right it's incredible but the question i want to ask you is see in the uh, there's a lot of possibility in space and one of the questions that fascinates all of us is is there life you know beyond earth especially you know people are fascinated with mars last you know five to seven yeah. five to ten years elon musk has made yeah. you know mars very popular because you know he has the steady dam of you know building a civilization yeah. on mars yeah as a you know a, the guy who is actually building a rocket company yeah how do you think about mars what are the possibilities and what do you expect to see happen there in next 10 to 20 years yeah so so uh, i think different people have different approaches like for example uh, uh, you know jeff bezos he believes a lot in uh, orbital ecosystem right you know, just around earth yet yeah. you have like you know large uh, stations where people right. several people can live manufacture yeah. stuff right. there are some materials which are very good for manufacturing in space like pharmaceuticals and you know optical fibers etc so they will be in future you know they'll be mostly manufactured in space there's a lot of a bustling industry will come up in space and elon musk has a fascination for mars uh, you know where, but but that is very true because in fact uh, if you see the closest places you know one is orbit okay but orbit cannot sustain beyond a particular limit and uh, and also it cannot sustain a civilization because in fact there was like more than five mass extinction events which happened right. before yeah. you know so uh, it's very difficult that an orbital ecosystem will survive right. uh, even a extinction right. event so to really have like a long term right. presence of humans in the solar system uh, you need to have something which has all the resources which humans can sustain but given your today's technology yeah. and the expenses involved yeah do you see a uh, actual manned mission to mars happening in next 20 years Yeah, and would you ever want to do that from Skyro itself? No, no, definitely it's possible in the next twenty years. The is in fact uh, like SpaceX is pushing the boundaries to make it happen. You know, literally pushing the boundaries. Yeah. And a company which has done sixty-one launches last year, I think, as a as a rocket scientist, I can tell that you know they are going at an exponential pace. And uh, because their core aim is you know getting to Mars and you know right. creating a self-sustainable. Have they announced any specific mission to uh, manned a mission to Mars? Or? Yeah, so they have been like wanting to do it from quite some time. Uh, you know, and uh, and also like uh, there was a project called Crew Dragon. You know, so where like uh, there's a Dragon spacecraft, which uh, a, a modified version of the existing winds. or which will launch humans to international space station right. so they wanted to launch but it is going to be few years away you know right. and now like uh, they are building their next gen rocket called starship yeah. you know which has really capability to put meaningful payload to mars including right. humans uh, so we have to see how that shapes up and i think uh, not many years away i would say right yeah and what about you know when do you think skyroot can get into position to seriously think about something like that yeah so like i mentioned right our core focus right now is to get to orbit and get to operational uh, efficiency you know profitability uh, so once these two are achieved you know we are in a platform where we could actually do the next big things and truly open space for all right and that needs like uh, investing in a rocket which will be the holy grail of rocketry you know so that is like the best rocket and that is the lowest cost ever which will take to put something you know anything any human Uh, you know cargo from earth to space you know do you believe india has some like definitive sustainable advantage in this yeah. industry for the long yeah. term yeah absolutely in fact uh, uh, i am a big very bullish about india in space because uh, 65% of our population is below 35 years old and and it has like tremendous number of engineering people uh, graduates you know so so just imagine the kind of engineering talent available right. in india and the aptitude for math and science yeah. right and the numbers are like alarming numbers right. if this kind of energy can be used yeah. in building uh, you know you, as i told like finally it requires fundamentals yeah. to design and build something in rockets so the right amount of training is required so this is basically energy is already there ready to harness yeah. and it is extremely cost efficient extremely extremely cost efficient you cannot even compare with anywhere else in the world who are space faring nations other than india so we have an extremely cost effect to resource right. which is moderately trained already mm-hmm. you know i think that is the fuel which is going to happen it, it depends on how is the imagination of entrepreneurs yeah that's it you know it's great to hear right i think i know with the make in india there is huge push now for the indian origin manufacturing yeah i think india is also on a this you know upward trajectory yeah. we've been growing 6 7% every year we'll go from 3 trillion dollar economy today to probably 25 trillion dollars in two th- by 2050 which is almost same size yeah. as that of us economy and india has a huge talent advantage yeah. so i think you know company like yourself which are pushing the boundaries proving to people you know what's possible and opening up you know large ambition across all kind of deep tech areas i think is going to be 
incredible. I absolutely agree with you. I think India is on the cusp of a revolution and you guys are kind of leading it from the forefront. So it's great to see, I think, you know, what the future, uh, how the future unfolds. Yeah. I want to now, you know, you've had five years building Skyroot. I know you think very long term, you have a lot of plans. But if you just look back, what are some of the key learnings, especially yeah. if you have to share those learnings with the, you know, first time entrepreneur? Yeah. What, what, what comes to mind? Yeah, I think the team is uh, very, very important. Mm -hmm. You know, I think, uh, and the culture in team is also very important. Right. In fact, like, you know, you stress it a lot as right. in, in all our meetings as well. Uh, so, uh, so in fact, nowadays when people ask me, what engineering streams would a rocket company need? You know, yeah. we would expect either aerospace engineering, mechanical engineering, or, you know, electronics engineering. Nowadays, I say people engineering. Right, right. <laughs> right. Yeah, absolutely. So, that's, uh -huh. what, that's what is required yeah. in uh, building a rocket company as well. I think... Uh, right people with the right mindset because if the mindsets are not aligned to building reliable cost effective products yeah. i think it's becomes i mean it it it'll, it'll take like probably milliseconds to just right. blast a rocket you know it's it it doesn't hold it's it's a culture which builds right. a successful company right. probably that's what i believe you know companies sure. like spacex have cracked it yeah. really well so that they're able to innovate even at very large uh, you know size of the company they're able to innovate very very fast because of the culture, the mindset of the people, you know, working in the organization. Right. And you mentioned you know, earlier, even in your earlier days, curiosity, learning about this. These days, how do you keep up? You know, how you're learning about what's happening? In fact, and second part of the question is, what is happening? You know, in what, what are the futuristic innovation space that you are tracking? Yeah. So, in fact, I track the sector quite, uh, uh, you know, quite keenly. You know, every day I uh, watch the news, what is happening, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And something which I am very interested, I have few things which are uh, my own interest, basically, in the space sector. One is the reusable, uh, you know, launch vehicle tech. And other is like sustenance in space technologies, which are used for sustenance in space. I track them very closely. You know, I see who, which companies are building the right products, what NASA is doing, what Russia is doing, what China is doing. You know, keep tracking all that. But of course, time is quite intermittent nowadays. Right. You know, but uh, still, I think, keep track of all these things. And uh, and, uh, and even if sometimes we miss the news, etc. Right. But I would probably sit for one day and just brush up things, what is happening across the world. Right. Yeah. Any crucial breakthroughs you're expecting in next, you know, five or ten years, which will be critical for the yeah. space industry? Yeah. So I think the next breakthrough is like consistent, reusable uh, vehicle right. launch. Yeah. You know, so what we saw in the aircraft industry, you know, mm -hmm. literally opened up, uh, uh, you know, travel to everybody. Right. So the earth is got opened up for everybody. Correct. Now next is space getting opened up for everybody. Right. And the only way is like similar to the aircraft journey. Yeah. Uh, the Wright Brothers journey, whatever they have happened. And uh, so now aircrafts are so low cost that we can go anywhere across the world. So rockets should also be uh, low cost so that whether it's cargo, people, everything can be, you know, launched at extremely low cost. And that will transform life like never we can imagine. And one of the biggest transformations which is going to happen even before that happens is 50% uh, of the world population getting high speed access to internet directly from space. Right. That's what, you know, a companies like, you know, uh, SpaceX with Starlink and OneWeb. And, you know, the multiple satellite constellations coming up in the next decade will give 50% of the world population with very high-speed internet directly from space. Yeah, I think as a space enthusiast, I think I'll be keenly watching for all those breakthroughs. Yeah. I'm also very optimistic that Skyroot will also play a leading role in enabling some of those breakthroughs. I think you're already leading the, you know, entrepreneurial ecosystem in many ways by, uh, you know, we have a thriving entrepreneurial ecosystem. But people are solving easier problems, yeah. solving problem of access. I think what Skyroot and you and Bharat has done is opened up people's eyes that we can actually tackle really hard problems, yeah. which, you know, which may seem out of reach. But once you start the journey with the conviction, thinking long term point of view, you find resources and people willing to help you and you have your own serendipity and journey. So I think, you know, hopefully that's going to inspire a lot more people to attempt much harder problems. But uh, I think it's been a it has been a fascinating conversation, Pawan. I learned a lot from this. I have tremendously enjoyed working with you last five years. I am looking forward to continue to work with you and really, you know, keep pushing the boundaries and establishing new frontier in this space. Yeah, likewise, Mukesh. I think wonderful conversation uh, which we had. And also, I think a new format of, uh, you know, uh, uh, conversation, I think we, I'm sure like it'll help a lot of people as well. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. You know, I am glad you, know, you were able to touch upon a lot of topics about space in a lot of detail. Yeah. So hopefully, you know, we'll manage to, you know, educate people about how does this industry work? What are the critical factors are? And I really appreciate you taking the time flying in all the way from Hyderabad to here for this conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Mukesh. <laughs>